Hello everybody, welcome to the Sims History Channel. Today we're going to be following four Ursuline sisters as they look at the second convent that they're considering turning into a convent school. Then we'll see the convent that they actually select and the renovations that they have to do to convert it into a school. Right now they're getting ready to make the trip and we're watching them wander around their home. Their current home is a typical medieval peasant house, slightly adapted from a model uploaded to The Sims 4 Gallery by Puffball22. I made it a little bigger so it could house four nuns instead of the three people it was designed for. I added an extra bathroom because Sims have to have a certain amount of plumbing, even if what they've got here is not typical for medieval peasants. And I put in a lot of custom content to make it look more baroque-ish, shall we say. The reason that they're looking to move into a different type of home and turn that home itself into a school has to do with something called the Council of Trent. If you're not interested in the Council of Trent, then skip the next five and a half minutes because I'm going to give you a quick overview of it. The Council of Trent was an 18 year long series of committee meetings attended mostly by church officials and by theologians. And in principle, they came from all over the world, but in practice, they mostly came from Italy. There were three major purposes for the council that Pope Paul III had called. The first was to answer Protestant criticisms of the church's teachings, which had been getting louder and louder and louder since 1518. The second purpose was to explain exactly where the church disagreed with Protestant ideas about theology and exactly why the church thought Protestants were wrong and the church was right. And along the way, the committee decided that they wanted to reform worship in ways that would make it more appealing and more meaningful to a popular audience and reduce corruption, which was a big problem in the medieval and renaissance church. Now you might think that it would be difficult to get a bunch of church people to agree on fine points of theology and you would be right if you thought that. In fact, since the Council of Trent was largely made up of representatives who had studied canon law, church law, that is, an awful lot of the participants were actually lawyers, it was even harder than you might imagine to get agreement on all of these issues. In fact, it was so difficult and so contentious that two more popes, Julius III and Pius IV, had to bring in a bunch of sessions during their own reigns in order to finish the committee's business. Now, I know what you're thinking. What about Pope Paul IV? Didn't he come between Julius III and Pius IV? What was he doing? Well, the fact is that uh, Paul IV was not exactly interested in compromise. He wasn't interested in agreeing with other people because he believed very strongly in the authority of the Pope, and he also was a huge fan of the Inquisition. In fact, when he died in 1559, the crowds in Rome were so happy that they took the statue of him in the square, put it on trial for its life, chopped off its head, and threw it into the Tiber River. So anyway, the committee meetings had to wait until after he died. He didn't actually contribute then to the Council of Trent, except in holding it up for a while. Now, there are a lot of websites that focus on the theological reforms of the Council of Trent, and not very many that I can find that talk about the social and worship reforms. So that's what I'm gonna focus on here. In terms of making the worship experience more meaningful, the church decided that they wanted to enforce a policy of having more churchy sounding music, of having lots of fancy church decorations, and of making sure that all the priests had a minimum education so that they would be able to at least uh, teach actual Catholic doctrine, create a sermon, and understand Latin when they saw it. The council also did its best to eliminate pluralism which was the practice of taking a bunch of different church jobs and paying somebody else half the salary to do them for you while you collected the other half for doing nothing. There was to be no buying and selling of church jobs. There was an actual 
uh, stock market for church jobs. There would be no giving your uh, church jobs to your friends and your family. And if you were creating, if you wanted your kids to be monks or nuns, you couldn't make them be monks or nuns. You had to wait until they were close to an adult. They had to make their own decision. And then there had to be a waiting period of at least a year, uh, in some cases three years, before their vows could be made. There was also a pretty big crackdown on nuns, led in many ways by Carlo Borromeo, designed not so much to make nuns more holy, but to make them look more respectable. So, for instance, nuns were supposed to dress like nuns and wear nunnish looking clothing. They weren't supposed to rent convents out to rich women. They weren't supposed to live at home. They weren't supposed to wander around outside without a proper escort. And they were not supposed to have visitors when they were in the convent, or at least they weren't supposed to have very many visitors, and they certainly were not supposed to have parties. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much what the Council of Trent was about. Going into seclusion means that you are living in your convent and that you don't leave it for any reason but an emergency. And this, for the Ursulines, was a challenge to their actual mission as an order. The Ursulines were founded by Angela Merici, who was born in 1474 and lived to 1540. And she spent all of her time working in the community. And her goal for the company of St. Ursula was that they would do works of charity in the community and work towards the Christian education of girls and women. This is, of course, very difficult to do if you live behind walls and only get to see people very occasionally. And so the Ursuline sisters had to find a way to continue their mission and still manage to appease the church hierarchy and live in seclusion. And their method for that is what we are exploring here in this video series. This small convent was uploaded to the Sims 4 gallery by Quantum Simology, and it is just spot on. It is the perfect little spot for uh, secluded religious from any era post Council of Trent right up until the early 20th century. And religious, by the way, is just the catch all term for monks and nuns, people who have given their lives to the church and are not actually priests working with congregations. You saw as we came in that there was a courtyard in front of the convent and there was a low wall surrounding it, but this is clearly not a defensive wall like in the last convent that we looked at. And as we come in here, we can see the kitchen that quantum symbology made for us. It's a nice size. Uh, it has a pantry in the back of it. and. Um, you know, it's clearly suitable for about, well, for exactly eight people to sit. And I apologize for my tremendous difficulty in handling the camera in this. That's just the way it is. But here in these shots from the dining room, you can see that there is also an interior courtyard, like we saw in the other monastery, where they can grow plants and that the convent really is built around that courtyard just as the other convent that we watched was. And you can see on the other side of the dining room, the waiting room area, right off the courtyard, you would come in there if you were a tradesman or if you were a family visitor of one of the sisters, and that's where you would wait to see them. As you come into the courtyard from the dining hall and turn to the right, you'll see the entrance to the chapel, and that's actually where we're going to go next. And see, here's a sister doing it now. You would have to have your own chapel. Now, this is not like the one we saw in the big 
monastery that we saw from Sims Dells, because this is not really a chapel intended for lots of visitors. This is a chapel for the sisters. So here we go in, and it is sparsely decorated because there's not a lot of religious decorations in the Sims. You'd have to download custom content for that. But you can see that it's a nice, comfortable spot, just the right size for the sisters, maybe their visiting priest, maybe one visiting family member, or a visiting postulant. Probably their family member wouldn't go in there, but they might have a couple of visiting nuns. At the rear of the courtyard, assuming again that you're coming in from the front courtyard and moving through, you have uh, a couple of different functions. And one of them is the bathrooms, which, you know, they're much more luxurious in this video than they would be in, the, in real life, but the Sims have to have things to survive. But there is this stroke of genius here, which is the visiting area. And you see that quantum simology has created this little situation where we have two chairs side by side in different rooms separated by grills. And this is actually, when you had a monk or nun in seclusion post-Trent, this is how they would receive visitors. You'd have this physical barrier, a grill, between you and whoever was coming to talk with you, so that there could be no impropriety. And then, finally, on the left side of the interior courtyard, again, left, assuming that you're coming in from the front courtyard, we have the individual cells for the religious. So one bed, one tiny little place to put your light. And really this is excellent if you want to put Sims in a convent or a monastery from any point in that 400 year period between you know, 1572 and say 1945, this is really perfect. And I applaud quantum simology for their work. Now we're going to take a look at the convent as it's been renovated by the sisters to serve as a convent school. Now before we do that, I want to point out that I have the sisters wearing my best... Oh look, there we have a little car running through to break all of my illusions of the 17th century. Anyway, you'll notice that I have the, have the sisters dressed in the best approximation I can come up with of, you know, Renaissance, Baroque normal people street clothing. And it's not very close, but at least it's kind of old-timey and they've got their head covered. So, eh, it is what it is. The reason that they're in street clothes as opposed to wearing uniforms, habits, which is what we call them, but they're, that's, the habit is the word for the uniform that nuns wear. The reason they're wearing these street clothes is that Angela Marici's original vision for the order was that they would live in small groups or at home inside the community that they served and that they would be spending an awful lot of their time outside their actual living space doing works of charity and educating people outside their house. To make them more effective in doing that, they were supposed to be dressed like ordinary people so that wearing a uniform would not put them um, away from the ordinary people. that would not set them apart. After this video series, when you see the sisters wandering around in my little version of 17th century France, they will be wearing their habits. Now you notice that they did make some changes. We put out at the front, if you didn't quite see it, uh, you'll probably see it again. We have some bars for the children to play on because they would need exercise and they would have had some kind of physical exercise. And I've created this long, narrow garden space and moved the tree. And that's because eventually there will be sisters who die while they're working in the convent, while they're living in the convent. Eventually they will die. And the custom with religious men or women throughout the church, has been historically to bury them on the property. So that your family, because you know the congregation that you live with really becomes your family, your family remains close to you. So anyway, we're going to be taking our little tour. I did put in a lot of little decorative details that weren't there before, so these bushes and the uh, 
uh, patterns in the stonework. There are some pictures right here at the entrance that are religious in nature. If you uh, were to download it, uh, I'm afraid you wouldn't be able to see them because these are from um, uh, Iron Leo 78 and they're not actually available anymore. Uh, I have changed the kitchen. I did put a refrigerator in it because there needs to be some kind of larder for them to get food from. That old convent actually was, the kitchen wasn't functional because without a refrigerator, the Sims can't actually cook. Um, but obviously, uh, quantum symbology was going for an accurate look and didn't want to include that in there. Um, I've also made it a little bit smaller because I've used that pantry space for something else. And as we walk through here, no, come back, come back, come back. Uh, this is the area that was the main waiting room, the main entrance in the old one. Um, and now you can see that it is a classroom. We have the little children's chemistry sets and we have their um, art tables in here. And because this is the art room, I've filled it up with lots of works of art. Now the works of art I've got here, a number of them are, again are from Iron Leo 78 and are not available. Uh, some of them though are still available and I will put those that information in uh, the credits. In the next room over, we see the, the desks of our students. So you can look down from there. You see the first classroom in the second classroom. That's where they have desks to work. Now, if you have the go to school mod, you have to have computers uh, in order to do all the activities. What I've put in here are notebooks. These are made by pl uh, plastic box and they will let you do all the writing functions that a computer does, but it doesn't let you practice typing. So if you really want to practice typing, you can download Esmeralda's crystal ball function, which does work exactly like a computer. However, it won't be here in any future 17th century videos because using a crystal ball is like witchcraft and the 17th century is the height of the witch burning period, so the Ursulans will not, 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 in the regular videos, be using a crystal ball. And let us move over a little bit more and take a look at the bathrooms. I've made them slightly smaller, and I have put in uh, some adaptations. You'll notice as you look throughout the building, actually, that I've put in a bunch of candles for the lights, and those candles are actually all made by Plastic Box uh, at Mod The Sims. But basically all I did in the bathrooms was add these things that look like little outhouse toilets. And as we go into the courtyard, you can see that we didn't change the courtyard very much either as we were making renovations. Except that they've put in a nice showy entrance to the schoolroom area from the courtyard. And as you turn around, you can see that the entrance to the um, chapel has a little bit more pomp and ceremony. The chapel, on the other hand, is considerably different than it was in the original version of this monastery. Now, some of these changes are cosmetic. So we can see that I've got religious decorations up there and a cross up at the front, and I shuffled the bookcases a little bit. And some of them are less cosmetic. You'll notice that there is a door on the left that there wasn't before. Uh, and that that door is gray and kind of subdued to kind of give you the impression that you're really not supposed to be wandering in it unless you've got an invitation. And there's another similar door at the back. And these doors actually are the critical piece because this is the solution that the Ursulines came up with. This configuration of rooms created a separate area where the nuns had their daily life had their cells and where the school was run. And the students would come from the outside of the, of the convent into the courtyard and into the schoolrooms, and they would never go near where the nuns were. And the nuns would come out of their rooms and through the chapel or just out of the, the convent side and through the interior courtyard and into the school space. So they never left home, right? They never left their convent but they were still physically completely separate from the other students. Um, these little candles, by the way, were uh, the ones that Plastic Box put together. And so there you have it. 
the Ursuline architectural solution to being able to teach girls successfully. Uh, they also, they also, in order to, uh, you know, make this stick, added a fourth vow to the three vows that most religious take of uh, obedience, chastity, and poverty. The Ursulines added a fourth vow of education of girls and women, so that this couldn't be taken away from them. Uh, they did lose. Um, their permission to do lots of works of charity out in the world, um, so they held on to their original teaching mission. And you'll see them as we play our 17th century France scenarios, as we run the experiments, usually in the background, and from now on, they'll be in habit. And if you see any of the kids in this game wandering off to school, now you know where they're going to go, because this is the equivalent of the elementary school for this setup. I hope you enjoyed this two video series and I hope that you come back for more. Bye!